Hello, good morning and welcome to Newsdex. Coming up in the next 60 minutes, President Kufado extends the appointment of the Auditor General Johnson Ikuyama Isiedu for an additional two years. We'll tell you why this decision is triggering conversations on major platforms in Ghana. Also in this bulletin, crisis in Ghana's public health facilities as a strike by the Medical Laboratory Professional Workers Union enters day four, crippling healthcare delivery with pregnant women, sick children, and persons with emergency cases left stranded at hospitals across the country. I'm here to take a lab, but I hear that the lab technicians or the central lab is closed, they are on strike. I'm pregnant and I'm tired. The walking, sitting in the car, the movement here and there is very difficult to reach. And later, businessman Richard Jacquard is expected in court today. We'll tell you what to expect. My name is Faustina Safo. The news is live on DSTV Channel 421, Go TV Channel 125. Across all our social media handles, we're Joe News on TV. Take a seat, be my guest. <music> For choosing us. Now we start with some patients with emergency cases at Kolebu Teaching Hospital left stranded as a strike by the Medical Laboratory Professional Workers Union paralyzes healthcare delivery in public hospitals across the country. While the union is unhappy about government's slow pace in negotiating conditions of service for its members and has vowed to keep the lab shut until a solution is found. Well, Joe News team of reporters have been monitoring the situation in the hospitals. Let's start from the capital here in Accra, where members of our health decks have been touring the Kolobo Teaching Hospital, the Greater Accra Regional Hospital, and the University of Ghana Medical Center. The impact of the strike is so visible, even to the blind. Patients are unable to access laboratory services. The strike has had a particularly severe impact on Ghana's largest reference facility, the Kolebu Teaching Hospital, leaving many patients, including pregnant women, children with cancer, and those requiring urgent blood transfusions, stranded and without care. The maternity area of the hospital is crowded with expectant mothers anxiously awaiting assistance. I'm here to take a lab, but I hear that the lab technicians or the central lab is closed, they are on strike. So I'm not able to do the lab. We were, it's the doctor who asked me to do the lab. So I supposed to see a doctor. So as I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about how I have to wake up early in the morning and reach here before six o'clock and how to take care of my children as well. But even in case the lab is in a good condition like today, I supposed to take the scan. So I'm appealing to the authority, those that are in charge, to help them solve their issue so that we too, we can also be happy. Because in my condition, all the way from La Paz, New Market to this day, I'm pregnant and I'm tired. The walking, sitting in the car, the movement here and there, is very difficult to reach here. I'm here to see the doctor and she gave me some love for me to bring them to her. Okay. But when I get to the laboratory, it has been closed. Okay, so what did you come to see the doctor about? It's about my health. They said my sugar level was too high, so they gave me a lab test to run. And you are also pregnant? Yes, it is. I have to go to the, maybe the private lab to do that. But for them, I'm very, very tired, so I'm having some rest. The children's unit, usually bustling with activity, is now deserted as children with cancer and sickle cell disease are turned away. The central laboratory, which functions as a crucial reference center for the entire greater Accra region and beyond, is also non-operational. All right, so this is the resource collection session of the central laboratory services. So on normally the all patients come for their results, this is where they come. So they drop their receipts here for the client service secretary to attend to them. 
So they build the web and print the results for them. So on that day, you come and the whole place is choked with patients coming for their their result that they've come to run previous days. So because of the strike, you can see nobody's here. Because the strike started on Monday. So ordinarily, the only result that will go out is maybe tell that linger on for like four days or seven days. Because we've not been working for Monday, so you won't expect to see patients seated here for reports. The Public Health Reference Laboratory, responsible for investigating disease outbreaks of major national concern, has shut its doors potentially delaying critical public health responses. The situation is equally dire at the Greater Accra Regional Hospital, where laboratories have closed, marked by red bands signaling the strike. Patients in need of lab investigations, including those with emergency cases, are being turned away, while some are forced to seek expensive services at private labs, which charge approximately three times the usual cost. Many with non urgent conditions are postponing or abandoning their treatments altogether. At the University of Ghana Medical Center, the main laboratories have ceased operations, leaving only a small mini lab functional. This mini lab, primarily intended for patients already in recovery, is now inundated with new cases as stranded patients flock to it for assistance. Things are moving on smoothly because apparently I came in yesterday. And then I heard of the strike yesterday when I came in. There were lots of people here. So I got scared. So I went home and then someone told me that UGMC is handling things for me. So I should come in today. So I came in and as expected, I'm being taken care of as smoothly as even if the labs were in. So, yeah. I was here around um, 6.30, exactly. I went to Cadro and then they sent me to the lab the other one and the main lab they said they are on strike so it took me about uh, three hours to wait for to get another lab here which is different lab for the main lab itself so i came and i'm waiting for the lab technician to come and attend to me they are working all right I think the mail lab also, they are faster than... The increased here. demand is placing tremendous pressure on the limited resources available, straining the facility's ability to provide adequate care. Well, that report was put together by head of our health desk, Fred Smith, and team members, Kenneth Jesse and Semifak Pesum. Now, let's take you to the Confanoti Teaching Hospital in the Ashanti region. Clinton Yebwa has been doing some checks. He filed this report. The Medical Laboratory Professional Workers Union is on strike over lack of conditions of service. The industrial action is taking a toll on health service delivery. Offices offering laboratory services at the Mensha Government Hospital in Kumasi have been closed with red banners and the inscription strike notice. Patients and their relatives are visibly distressed as they are hardest hit by the strike. This 81-year-old lady whose daughter is undergoing a post-delivery treatment is stranded in accessing lab services. My child is dying. I am begging you, government of Ghana. I am old. Where am I going to get money to access private facility? The situation is the same at the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital as OPD attendees are directed to private labs. But the patients complain of the high cost of accessing private lab services. The cost outside is expensive. They took 670 cities, which ordinarily I wouldn't pay if I had the lab service here. So a subsidiary effect of the strike action is that offices, other offices have been closed and not working. For example, the disease control units who await results from the laboratory to act on have also been left um, idle. And it's the same situation when you go to the maternity unit as well. The Ministry of Health has appealed to the striking lab workers to call off their strike and return to the negotiation table. The Ashanti Regional Chairman of the Ghana Association of Medical Laboratory Scientists, Dr. Eric Kofi Edu, 
told Joy News the role of laboratory scientists in hospitals has been undermined for a long time. But it is not a wish that we get to at this point. I mean, all of us have sisters, brothers, family people and all that. So in times like this, sometimes I feel that uh, what if uh, my mom is ill? What if my sister is ill or something? But you see, uh, we wouldn't have wished that things got here. But it's unfortunate that uh, we need to make things happen. You see, the medical lab scientists have been ignored for a very long time. The medical lab scientists play a very pivotal role in the healthcare delivery system. But you see, uh, things have gone too way back, and we feel that two years since we started doing this. Dr. Kofi Edu is, however, hopeful of a positive response to their plea to resume servicing patients. So, I mean, the, 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 the minister and the Labour Commission should have intervened for us to, I mean, agreed on things and not get here. And we wish that things are not going this way. And we feel for the people that we render services to. But it's unfortunate. So we feel that, that we can still handle things as early as possible if the government intervene and then call us to the table. But uh, these are petty, petty allowances that we feel that we deserve, you know. And so if the government take a critical look at it, I'm sure he should be able to agree to all the things that we've stated. Reporting for joining us, my name is Clinton Yaboa. We're monitoring the situation across the country and we would be engaging the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission in subsequent bulletin. But let's do some other stories because President Okufuado has extended the appointment of the Auditor General, John Sinekuyama Isidu, for an additional two years. Now, this extension was announced in a notice from the Audit Service dated July 19, which was addressed to all staff. Now, according to this notice, Mr. Isidu was originally due for retirement on the 1st of August 2024. Now, on your screens, that is coming up shortly. And it says, extension of the appointment of the Auditor General. I wish to bring the to the information of all staff of His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Ghana, um, has extended the tenure of the Office of the Auditor General, Mr. Johnson Ikuyama Isidu, for the next two years. Now, this statement, as simple as it is, or may seem, is leading conversations on all social media platforms, with a lot of people questioning the president's decision. Now, let's take you to the next slide of that statement. Mr. Johnson Ikiyama Asiedu was due for statutory retirement from service on the 1st of August, 2024. Now, the statement goes on to say the service extends its congratulations to the Auditor General on the extension of his appointment. Now, as we've said, this statement may be simple, but it's leading conversations on major platforms. And I'll tell you why, because we're casting our minds back to the year 2021 when President Akufuado directed the former Auditor General, Yao Dumelovo, to proceed on leave after accumulating 123 days. Now, on March, Two, a day before Mr. Dumelovo was scheduled to return from his leave, the Audit Service Board questioned his nationality and age, saying he should have retired in 2020 and that he's Togolese. Well, the board also based these claims on records at the Social Security and National Insurance Trust provided by the Auditor General, where his date of birth is said to be June 1, 1960 and not June 1, 1961. Well, Mr. Dumelovo, however, refuted these claims. But why is this triggering a lot of conversation. Fast forward to 2024, and that's why I have head of our research desk in the studio, Raymond Aqua. Why is this a big deal at this time, Raymond? Now, you have to go back to when mm. the very gentleman, Daniel Domlevo, was appointed in 2016. Mm. He was replacing Richard Corte, who had retired at the time. He came in at a time that the other service had been accused of failing to comply with uh, legal proceedings, not ensuring that the right thing is done, merely issue reports, and the grouping parliament will issue the audit uh, review report. They will sit on it. An audit recommendation implementation committee is supposed to also finally implement some of these things by hands up not being dealt with. So... He was said to be an extraordinary auditor general for some of these reasons. Mm. 
he implemented the powers of surcharge and disallowance. And I'll tell you why this is important. I mean, it was attached to the office of the Auditor General. It reached a point that it had never been implemented in the entire Fourth Republic. Mm. This is the power to say you fail to do specific work. So instead of just reporting it in my audit report, I'm asking you to pay the amount of money and I'll take it from you. So can this allow amount paid to you and ask that you return the money? And in this case, sometimes you are asking public servants to make direct payments. This became problematic later on and people connect this strongly to mm. the very things that happen. It reached a point, Auditor General went to court in 2017 and Dom Level committed to implementing this vigorously. He did some of that anyway. Now, some also believe that through his diligence and commitment to protecting the public purse, he recovered millions of cities for the state. The President of the Republic of Ghana is on record to have said that some 4.6 billion was recovered under uh, Daniel Domilevo. An indication that under his presidency, they were dealing with corruption, they were dealing with wastage, and they were dealing with the very things that stopped us from getting money for important things. Then he was also known to have introduced an electronic data system for filing what is supposed to be what ministers, public servants file as their records before they enter public office, declaration of assets. So those were innovative things that many had attributed to Dom Level's stay in office. Of course, the only time he had failed to implement a direct report and Auditor General's issue reports. Mm. Mostly, we will see the reports two, three, or sometimes five years later when the gentleman is out of office or we cannot find them or it's been a very long time. During Dom Level's time, he was sticking to the time. Indeed, it is a record that the only time he delayed was when he was asked to go and leave. That was when the report of the Auditor General was actually delayed. All of this put together, he became the standard bearer for the fight against corruption for most people in the Republic of Ghana. And they are renewed hope that with Dom Level in office, there was nobody who was going to be corrupt. But what you referenced earlier, mm. he was asked to proceed on leave in June 2020, effective July 1st. And the gentleman we are talking about today who's had an extension, Johnson Ekuamwa, who was one of his deputies, to take over. Mm. Now, it was key. The conversation at the time was that he had accumulated so much leave within the period that he needed to take it because it would exceed the period he was in office if he's allowed to continue. That's 123 days. Yes. Mm. Now, this was further extended along the line anyway, based on the back and mm. forth with the office of the president. Not long after that directive was given to Dom Level, mm. effectively, like 12 days later, Professor Koko Asari had filed a case at the Supreme Court. This was followed in October that same year of 2020 with another case by nine civil society groups who had also gone to challenge the president's right to ask the Auditor General to proceed on leave. They felt it was unconstitutional. The general theory was that if we allow that be, presidents will willingly sack people they didn't like, especially people who were doing critical work which affected governance in many forms. So that was the argument that was actually posited at the time. And we know that that decision came way later on when Dom Lobo yes, was no after, longer in when office. when he was no longer in office. Brilliant. But I talked about surcharge and mm. disallowance. Mm. It was one of those surcharge and disallowances that became very controversial. This involved the Crow and Associates case. Now, when Mr. Dom Levo was asked to proceed on leave, he was in court with senior minister Yao Safumafo and others. Why was that important? In December 2019, he has surcharged the senior minister and others for $1 million for paying Crow and Associates, an auditing firm, uh, for no work done and also for not obtaining parliamentary approval before contracting the company. Mm. When he was asked to leave office, there is evidence that the current Auditor General, who's got an extension, actually took over and now issued a report after inspection and said there was work done. It was the view of Mr. Dom Level, who was in court with uh, 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 the senior minister and crew and associates that there was no work done and other issues he raised against them. Indeed, when he was asked to step aside, 
and the new, uh, the our current Auditor General took over office, his team came to the conclusion there was work done. Eventually, Jao Asafu Marko Eko won the case in court. Mm. So those who tied that particular case mm. to why he was removed, because it sounded strange that a man, of course, mm. you had mentioned the issues that he had raised. Yeah. Issues well, about... Uh, his nationality. First and foremost, they and said he was Togolese and was not Ghanaian. It was also moved to the specific date that he was actually born. Mm. And whether or not he has exceeded the mandatory retirement age, it is this fight over mandatory retirement age Mm. which is now raising concerns within the circles that if Dom Level had to leave hook or cook and take accumulated leave. Mm. Because he was approaching retirement age. Yes. Then why give an extension to the current Auditor General? The that, question that, on the that, minds that, of that, many. That is what's generating that mm. contention. That is why some believe that he was fine until he touched crew and associates the case. And that certainly we found ways of leave, taking him out. At least we know subsequently mm. that the Supreme Court said the decision to ask him to proceed on leave was unconstitutional. Clearly. And that he shouldn't have actually been asked to proceed on leave. As to whether the current decision, of course, presidents have done so, they have extended for other people in other sectors, and those references were made. Mm. In fact, at the time, people took time to list those who had been 60 and above in public office in similar positions who were not being touched or asked to proceed on leave or who were not being considered for any form of, uh, yeah, you have outstayed your welcome and so you should leave in the first place. That is why some people then connect cases he dealt with mm. and the time he was supposed to leave office to why he was asked to proceed on leave. Now, you've heard some raised concerns about whether or not, and let's be clear, we've not had a single surcharge. I stand to be corrected. At least I've heard four civil society groupings issue four different indications, including Occupy Ghana, about why the regime of surcharging and disallowance had ceased with Daniel Domilevo leaving office within that period. Of course, I mean, some will say that the new Auditor General has done other things that like, for example, also raising concerns about the conduct of some people and doing special audits and all of that, releasing reports, including some that were previously started before him and doing the current one. Mm. So he continued some of the work of Daniel Domlevo, but others appear to have abandoned. And the key one that people actually highlight is the search out and disallowance many felt were the main reason, main reason why Daniel Domlevo had to be asked to leave office. Mm, thank you so much, Raymond Aqua of our research decks. Now, let me bring in an anti corruption campaign and vitals as him. One of the many people who felt President Kufado should not have asked the former Auditor General Daniel Yaldumelovo to discontinue his service despite exceeding his retirement age. He joins us live on phone with more. Now, this conversation is raging. People are wondering what this means to the fight against corruption. You see, certain positions. The public's interest, sorry, confidence and trust in these institutions matter a lot mm. with regards to their judgment of their performance. So what this has happened is that people will now go out with the perception that the current man is playing ball with the president and his appointee. Mm. And that's why the president to extend his appointment. Because, like you said, somebody was there handling a case in court, yet the president found an to ask him to see the leave. And then that case keeps on approaching. In fact, the current officer general wrote to Mr. Savo Mouse that he's satisfied with the documents that he has submitted. So that one million pounds or eight dollars has just gone into the water. Mm when Dom Levo was making all efforts to receive those money. So that alone, even at the time that this man was appointed, some of us said, uh, the way he was appointed, and the way he immediately came out to, to say to this Mr. Osama Mahmoud case, means that he's the good books of the government. What he's going to do, is going to please the president and his appointees. And this confirms that, because see, even though the constitution allows me to extend the appointment of certain people, there has to be the And consistency is also important in good governance. Why, in the case of the Monroe, you were asked to go 
And then in this case, it has to be stable and all two years. And remember that the next two years, this President Kubado is not going to be in power. Mm. So again, I will see it as a way to protect his future immediately after he leaving office. So that the Auditor General will not come out with any damaging reports about he and his appointees. Mm. So in that case, it's not helping the fight against corruption. We have said before that mm. these accountability institutions should not just be solely appointed and fired by the president. There should be an independent committee, non partisan, that to hold clean applications, but if you advertise, the committee will clean, clean the application, conduct interviews, and at least produce three people for the president to decide on one. And this was contained in the Constitutional Commission report. So when you do this, you always tell us that you are not interested in the fight against corruption. Mm. Now, let's go back to the Supreme Court's ruling because that's, that's of key concern at this point in time. The Supreme Court ruled that the president acted unconstitutionally when he asked Malabo to proceed on leave and then subsequently release him of his duties. Now, some people would argue that is probably the reason why the president has decided to extend the appointment of the current AG. What's your thoughts on that? You see, the circumstances are not the same. I'm not a lawyer, but the fact that that law, that, that ruling was against the president, does not give him the go ahead to now continue to extend people's appointment. If you remember, one of Domino's, Domino's things was that people should not be allowed to stay in office beyond retirement. And I think the finance minister at the time, Kino Boyd, also came out to say this. So, you see, what was wrong in the past cannot be wrong today, mm. unless the law has changed. Mm. So if the president saw it wrong for the vote to stay in office beyond state, which was given a debate, a disputable issue, why is there that anything wrong with keeping this man for another two years? Especially when you know you're leaving office in, in December or January. Is it not to protect yourself and your appointees from any adverse body reports? Mm. And isn't for you yourself, you are afraid of your, 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 yourself and your report, I mean your, your appointee. So you want to protect them. Well, these are questions we're seeking answers to. And thank you so much for your time here on Newsdex, Vice President Azim, an anti-corruption campaigner. Well, this conversation is raging across all our social media handles. You can share your thoughts about it. We are Joy News on TV. Let's do some other stories now with unexplained kidney failure and other health conditions surging in Ghana. It is crucial to watch what you eat and where you eat. Well, that's because data from the Food and Drugs Authority based on the World Health Organization projection reveals that unsafe food causes over 200 diseases, leading to the loss of over 33 million healthy lives. There's more in this report by Carlos Caloni. What you eat could be killing you silently. The latest Food and Drug Authority FDA data indicates that consuming unsafe food results in the loss of 33 million healthy life years annually. In a speech read on her behalf at an event to mark World Food Safety Day, Chief Executive Officer of FDA, Dr. Delise Mimidaku, revealed that over 200 diseases are linked to unsafe food each year. Her deputy, Roderick Danieje spoke on her behalf. WHO estimated that 33 million years of healthy lives are lost due to eating unsafe food globally each year. And this number is likely an underestimation. Over 200 diseases are caused by eating food contaminated with bacteria, viruses, parasites, and chemical substances such as heavy metals. This growing public health problem causes considerable socio-economic impact through strains of healthcare systems, lost productivity, 
and harming tourism and trade. He further cautioned the public to avoid buying food from unlicensed vendors as the FDA intensifies efforts to improve food quality and safety. For you also making a choice to buy from a vendor who is selling next to the gutter, that horrible gutter, that thing that we keep saying that the best watch is sold by the gutter, if you didn't, pro if you didn't um, purchase it, they will not have service and therefore they will move away. One of the things that we are doing currently, for example, is we are pushing the issue of progressive licensing scheme. On the food, food vendor side too, we are working with the local government. It is a scheme that is already underway where we have officers every day, countrywide, going around. Number one, they are giving education, they are sensitizing the street food vendors. They are telling them that, you need, number one, you need to have a health certificate. And this is where it also concerns the whole of Ghanaians. You must also ask them, do they have the health certificate, number one? Number two, when you also go, when you also go there, check and see whether they've got what we call the street food vendor permit. The street food vendor permit is something that they are supposed to stick. It has got a QR code on it. Don't patronize food from those who don't have it. It means that we don't know where their food is coming from. And then some of them too, they take forever in trying to um, come up. They think that there will be the tolerance. So now we are driving people off the market to ensure that the right thing is done. That is why I say food safety is everybody's business. Don't patronize it if it has not got the street food vendor permit, as well as the, you also ask them where is their health certificate. If they cannot produce that to you, that person is there selling illegally. Some food vendors at the event, however, believe the FDA should focus on intensifying its monitoring to improve the country's food safety rather than just issuing certificates. Um, it, it doesn't mean that it cannot be done. It is more than visible to do. But do they even have the manpower or the resources to make sure that every cocoa seller or every wache um, cooker or seller, they have the people to um, certify them, if I should put it that way. If they have those resources, then voila, we won't even have to look out for. You already know well, I don't think it ensures any form of safety at all because they, unless they, they do their regular checks, we are still at high risk because sometimes when you go and you see how they even handle the food, the cough, the way they handle themselves is very unhygienic. So until FDA steps in, me as an individual, the most I can do is report the person or report them to uh, emergency food safety, yada, yada, and so forth. This year's World Food Safety Day themed Food Safety Prepare for the Unexpected also highlighted the devastating impact of unsafe food on children. For Joy News, Carlos Caloni, Accra. Now, the Ghana Landscape Restoration and Small Scale Mining Project is working with over 200,000 farmers in the Cetre Afram Plains to adopt eco-friendly farming methods to address sustainable, um, unsustainable farming practices which have gradually degraded the land. Well, Mahmoud Mohamed Nuruddin has more in this report. And currently there's an ongoing project, World Bank sponsored, Ghana Landscape Restoration and Small Scale Mining Project. And uh, Drobonso or Cetre Afram Plains District is playing a key role in it whereby we engage the farmers and communities. The farmers are engaged to put in place a, a, a pra sustainable agricultural practices that will help to sustain the richness of the land. Due to the burning and uh, poor farming practices, we've lost uh, the, the richness of the land. And when we plant, we hardly get uh, the produce that we wanted. So the, this project, Ghana Landscape Restoration and Small Scale Mining Project coming on board, the farmers are trained on proper agricultural practices. And at the moment, about 18 communities uh, comprising of over, almost 2,000 farmers have benefited from it, input and also uh, guidance on how to go about it. In support of the global restoration efforts advocated by environmental experts and organizations to rehabilitate degraded lands, the Setre Afram Plains Traditional Council has allocated land for large-scale plantations. The district has also taken the lead in restoration efforts comprising about 50 hectares in the last two years. Tawud Abbas 
is the head of environmental protection agency epa at the konongo area for the past two years we planted about uh, close to 50 hectares in the drobo uh, drobo area let me see the central farm plains district and this year we have also earmarked to plant more than uh, 400 hectares of riparian vegetation we are we go to places communities where the land is degraded then together with the community members the project provides them with seedlings of their choice and of course indigenous seedlings and then they are planted and we don't just leave it like that we keep on monitoring and making sure that they all survive so for, uh, this is what EPA is. we are doing all other, um, a lot of things to help uh, restore the environment but we need the support of everybody because when we plant and we leave the people here need to take care of them if they don't take care of them they would all die. And all the effort that the government has put in it, uh, development uh, partners have put in it, will all go to waste. And we all suffer the consequences thereof. The EPA carried out a joint initiative with Mirror Forestry and Timber Products to plant trees at Drobonso to foster public interest in land restoration. Dawood stresses the importance of community ownership of such initiatives, emphasizing that locals should actively care for the trees as direct beneficiaries. And whatever we are planted to, we need to take care of them. Like Nana said, normally we plant, we leave them, and then they, they are dead. We don't benefit from it. But this time, Can I let us all be part of it. Group Compliance Manager at Mero Forestry and Timber Product, Ms. Ernestina Osei Pepra underscores the significance of supporting endeavors aimed at enhancing livelihoods in communities within the operational areas, recognizing them as key stakeholders. As, as I said, we are a tree growing company, but aside what we grow and harvest for commercial uh, purposes, we also have about 40% of our total lease areas put under conservation, where we do active management such as weed control and even carry out enrichment planting in areas such as um, riparian areas, that's the areas around rivers and streams within our concession. So we try to we plant the trees to protect the rivers and the streams. You know. The traditional leaders commend the EPA and Mero Forestry and Timber Products for their extensive efforts and environmental conservation in Drobonso and its surrounding areas. A report by Mohamed Nuruddin. Taking a quick break, we'll be back with more to stay tuned in. Hi, good morning. Welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Former Finance Minister said Tekwe has warned Ghana's economy is still facing deep structural challenges despite the growth recorded in the first quarter of 2024, 4.7%. According to him, although the growth is laudable, the government must not be complacent because the country is not out of the woods yet. Speaking on Affront, uh, Mr. Tekwe urged the government to ensure it sustains the economic, uh, current economic momentum. Of the suspension of debt, which may have made more budget resources available, which would come, you know, to us from about 2017, sometimes as early as 2018, certainly through 2027. Uh, the program will then be still continuing. We do also have, you know, a situation um, with respect to inflation going down the road uh, towards the end of the year, the dry season, the toughest part. This is the best time for inflation to the extent that, you know, the uh, uh, rains have been good, harvest may be good, it happened last year. Uh, in a sense, what I'm saying is that the economy is in deep structural challenges, and therefore we should be cautious in not being complacent with the developments that are happening now. We may be misreading, you know, of course, now there's better surveillance. What is going on? As in 2017, 2018, bail out and other conditions. This time it's reliefs that are bringing in these results. 
only to wake up or to have woken up, woken up back then in 2019 for all the figures you know, to be revised. So I would say that uh, these are good numbers for the sake of the economy because things are really tough you know, for Ghanaians and I would hope that we will sustain you know, the momentum uh, to get uh, better use of the fund and World Bank and other resources than we have done you know, in the past, for example, with the magnificent injection of almost six billion US dollars into the economy without, you know, which rather took us into a tailspin, in addition to the which included the deficit financing, which I was talking about. Now, cattle sellers at Tichiman Market experienced poor sales this Eid season. The, they attribute the low sales to the harsh economic conditions and the high action rate of the safer compared to the Ghana city. The cattle sellers are appealing to authorities to intervene. Anas Sabit visited the market and filed the following report. The current economic hardships across the country has taken a toll on all faces of the Ghanaian economy, including cattle business here at the Tichiman Cattle Market. As Muslims across the globe mark the Eid al Adha festival, which is known as the Feast of Sacrifice, we take a look at the sales of cattle here in Tichiman and how the high cost of these sacrificial animals is affecting this year's Eid al Adha festivities. These sellers say this year's sales has been terrible compared to same period last year. They attribute the low sales to the current economic hardship across the country and appeal to authorities to intervene. This year, the Encore because Oman Wadi, the Ohaina, Boy Doma Bagina, Bakoka, New Ayako, Umuse, Umuse, Umu, the Odi, Soda Baba, and Nakofi, and Nakotu, Nina, a Kamunuka. Others also believe that the exchange rate of the CIFA is partly contributing to the high cost of these sacrificial animals, which is adversely affecting sales this year. If you go to Dubai, uh, there are other Francophone countries coming there, and their currency, the CIFA, no? if they convert to the cities, they have more plenty money than us, have you seen? So if you are going to comp uh, compete with them, to bring the cows here. You have to add more money to your own, have you seen, before you can bring the cows here. That's why the prices are increasing like that. Abu Ismaila is here to buy a sacrificial animal for the eat. He sees the high cost of these animals means he's unable to get one even with 5,000 Ghana cities. In terms of the pricing, very, very expensive. First, an animal that we bought last year around 2,500, now it's probably around 7,500. So you can see the increment. So it's not easy. My inspiration was that, like 5,000, I should be able to get one. But when I got here, the information is that 5,000, you cannot even get one. So the least you can get is around 6,000, 6,500, and then 7,000. So that's the challenge I'm facing. Both these sellers and buyers here at the Tichiman Cattle Market are appealing for government's intervention to help boost trade within the Eid season. What I can say is that, they, like, they should see how the cost of living for the citizen will go down, so that they can, we can also afford things to buy. I will advise them or appeal to them that they should work 
to make sure that the interest rates are brought down so that we'll be able to also live comfortably in the economy. Reporting for Joy News, Alas Sabit, Tichiman. All right, that's it for this segment. More news after this break. Don't go anywhere. Thanks for staying with us. Now, prosecution in the ongoing ambulance procurement case will this afternoon continue with its cross-examination of businessman Richard Jacob. Now, today's cross-examination will be the third time the prosecution has come face-to-face -face with a third accused who has accused the Attorney General of embarking on a political witch hunt and vindictiveness disguised as seeking justice for the state. But for Richard Jaffa's style of giving lengthy answers to questions put him by the director of prosecution today would have been the last window for the prosecution to cross-examine the third accused. Well, the trial judge is exercising her discretion on Tuesday after failing to get Richard Jaffa to comply and give straight to the point answers, suspended the six hour time limitation initially allocated to the prosecution within which they had to conclude their own cross-examination of the witness. Now, it remains unclear if the trial judge will reinstate the hour's limitation today or will allow the prosecution to have an open-ended time slot to cross-examine Richard Jacob. Well, stay tuned in as we bring you live updates from the courtroom here on Journeys. My name is Faustina Safo, and that's it for Newsdex. For more news, please log on to myjoeonline.com. Have a pleasant morning as you enjoy the rest of our programs.